Welcome to Nick's Home Court with your host. My name is Greg Armstrong. Nick's preseason game number four. Joe Kim Noah finally plays. J.R. Smith signs a four-year, $57 million contract. Is he overpaid? Carmelo Anthony is ranked number 15th in the NBA by Slam Magazine. And he's mad about it. Coming up on Nick's Home Court. Music by BenSound.com Again, people, welcome to Nick's Home Court. This is episode number 13. I just finished uh, seeing the Knicks preseason game against the Boston Celtics. Pretty entertaining. And I'm just going to come with a few takeaways I've noticed from the game. Um, Joe Kim Noah. It was good seeing him out there today. Joe Kim Noah, man, you, you saw exactly what I said. He is basically a defensive and offensive blue guy. He brings so, he's like a a Hall of Fame intangible guy. He brings so much great intangibles to a team. You know, if he's healthy, he's going to win a championship. Because he's that kind of guy that like basically holds a team together. Even though he doesn't score and he doesn't, but he does everything else like at an elite level. Like he is really... He could be the rock of a team without being the best player on the team. But you got to see yesterday exactly why people like Joe Kim Noah. He's out there rebounding and playing D and getting back to his man. You know, there was a point where he led the break and gave a pass to Justin Hamilton for the three or for the jump shot. I'm not sure if it was a three or open jump shot, whatever, but he led the break. He literally, if he was six foot three, six foot five, he'd probably be a great point guard, I tell you. But you know, he knows how to play the game. And and I was very impressed, and people got to see what Joe Kim brings to the table. Like, he makes them look like with Joe Kim out there, the Knicks starting to look, they look legit with him out there. And that's no slight on Carmelo or anyone else, but with Joe Kim out there. They start looking like a defense. You saw the immediate improvement on their defense with him out there anchor, anchoring the defense. Brandon Jennings continued to look good. You know, he made a few good plays, and and, and he's looking like he's really going to be a quintessential six man. I never would think of him that way. I've always thought that he was a starting player in this league, but I could see him coming off the bench and being like, an elite six man not scoring but changing the pace of the game getting the game going and getting his teammates running you know because he he, he, he he's not a natural scorer as Derrick Rose so for all y'all who say oh he should start off his don't, don't even say it don't even say it Derrick Rose is a natural scorer in that we need scoring as well as penetrating and things like that but Brandon Jennings played well um, I want to talk about Kuz for a second here. You know, he had, I think, 18 points in 19 minutes. One thing I can say about that guy is he's not shy. He will come in shooting the ball. But understand, he's 26. He's a grown man. The guy kept saying he was 27. I don't know if he's 27, 26. The screen said 26. Uh, the announcer kept saying 27. doesn't really matter. He's around that age. And which puts him in the prime of his athletic career also. And... He's out there showing no fear. But I got to tell Nick fans, pump your brakes a little bit on him. He's not really ready to get NBA minutes yet. And the reason why I say he's not really ready, because I see on defense a few times he was lost out there. He scored, but I'll tell you this, he scored 18 points on instinct. Like literally just out there playing ball. (laughs) No rhyme or reason, I'm out here playing. So I think... uh, First month of the season, I don't expect him to get much time. But as the season goes on, I see his minutes increasing as he gets used to the NBA game. He's a keeper, 
folks. He's a good player. By the end of the season, he's going to be an important rotation player. But right now, I don't think he's ready for heavy rotation minutes. Well, who knows? You know, hey, who knows? Maybe. But right now, I don't think he's ready at this moment. 18 points. Don't get fooled by the points and how he came in and played. That was the second unit. You know, I saw a lot of mistakes out there that if he played against uh, first unit talent or better talent, that would have been turnovers and things like that. He was just, you know. But, again, the boy has talent. It's undeniable. <sighs> I got to talk about Kylo Quinn. Kylo Quinn looks like hot garbage. He looked like hot shit. Hot doo-doo. <laughs> Taking three-point shots and, 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 like, missing everything. I mean, if Kylo Quinn didn't have... I wouldn't be surprised. I think he's a trade chip. I don't think he's going to be on the Knicks for long. I think he's going to get traded for, like, a draft pick. Because I think... I mean, unless he's really that much of a locker room presence, I really don't see why he should be on this team. That's how much I'm down on Kylo Quinn. For everything he, good he does, he, he's he been... This preseason, he's shown me. He'll do one good thing and five bad things. I'm sorry. Kylo Quinn is just not looking good to me right now. You know, and he's feeling the pressure of, of Hernan Gomez and the other big guys. And he's trying to make things happen, but he's limited. He's not that talented. You know, he's an effort guy, and he's, he's trying to show more, but he doesn't have it, you know. And, and it's frustrating watching him out there because... He's in the old mold of a basketball player. He's a 90s basketball player. He's a player you to put in the game to hack people, you know, and and hit a shot every now and then. He's a throwback type of player. And, and it's just not, the league is not made for a player like him. You know, it, I don't know. Not really feeling him. I must talk about Bujicic. Everybody wants him off the team. But you know what? I've had a change of heart. I don't want him off the team. If he's going to make shots, he's a plus on your team. Yeah, his defense is not good. There's no doubt about that. But he's good out there with the second unit. He knows what to do. And if he's knocking down shots, he's a plus player. Let me tell you a few things. Another few things about Vujicic nobody's considering. He's a total pro. He's in the shape. He's in great shape. Nobody ever talks about that. Do you ever see him get tired out there? He's in great shape. He's up and down the court. Everybody wants to see all these young players, but they're not good. Vujicic is proven in the league. He's not a great player at all. But he's a good role player. Not for too many minutes, but if he's hitting shots, he's a plus player. He knows what to do. You know, he's easy. I mean, he's constant motion. You need guys like that on your team. And to me, in this preseason, he's outplayed Justin Hamilton. He's outplayed him. And I'll talk about Justin Hamilton more. He he actually ended up with some good stats at the end of the game. But I saw a lot of things with Justin Hamilton I did not like. I think he might be on the chopping block. Ron Baker is a keeper. Just knows how to play the game, man. If you watch the game out there, when I looked at the stats, I thought when I saw it before I saw the stats, I thought Ron Baker had like I don't know, maybe eight points, five rebounds, three assists, something like that, right? Now, Justin Holiday had 13 points. I think he had six rebounds and five assists. Great stats. But to me, Ron Baker was making a far greater impact in the game with less numbers. Numbers can lie. And Ron Baker just looks like one of those players that knows where to be. You know, he's always he's in the right place at the right time. He makes the right play. You need guys. He's he, he reminds me of a glue. He's a glue guy with offense. And and I think he's going to make this team. He might even get rotation minutes uh, later on later in the season. What can I say that hasn't been said about Hernan Gomez? Billy. Billy! <laughs> Billy out here balling, man. He's going to take Kylo Quinn's minutes quickly. It ain't going to take that long. Seriously. He's going to start getting major minutes. He's just that. He's just talented. You can see it. He's talented around the hoop. He has a nice feathery touch. Just watch out for him. And I got to say this. Nick's defense is a problem. 
You see, the way Hornacek wants to play, the way he wants to play the game, you have to have defense and rebounding. Because the Knicks do look nice when they get out on the break. It looks good. Melo trailing, hitting those threes. It looks good when they're out on the break. And the players are starting to look like they're having fun out there doing it. But if you don't play defense, that's a surefire way to for the Knicks to lose. Because their half-court offense is still not great. And that's being generous. On the break, when they get out there on the break and they're just doing little quick pick and rolls, quick, quick hits... When they out there doing quick hits on the on the fast break, they look good. That's when they look good. But you can't get those fast breaks without defense. Now, don't be fooled by the score. Because, you know, I heard the announcer say they gave up this many amount of points. Yes, the defense is a problem. But with the style of play that the Knicks are trying to play, it's going to be high-scoring games, even in their victories. Usually, it's gonna, they're not walking the ball up the court. So it's going to be a higher score in games. It's going to be more possessions for both teams when you play against the Knicks. They're going to get up and down the court. And they have to get better at it. And they need to be better than other teams at it, you know. But, again, to do this, you need to be able to play some defense. Because if you're not playing defense, you can't go on a run. You can't fast break. You can't do any of those things. I didn't analyze game three. Well, I'm not going to analyze every preseason game. It just so happened that this preseason, preseason game took place on a Saturday. And usually, I like to either prepare my podcast or do my podcast on a Saturday and upload it Sunday for all the Nick fanatics because there's nothing to listen to on Sunday. So this is why I do it. They just so happen to have a game. And by the way, I didn't say this early in the podcast. I might as well get it out the way now. You can find Nick's home court podcast on life culture sports on itunes no spaces you can also find on youtube under like under under nick's home court episode 12 or you can go to the website life culture sports forward slash nick's home court therefore you'll find all the nick's home court episodes that i've done you can also go to soundcloud which is also Life Culture Sports. It's not just about the Knicks. This is the Knicks version of Life Culture Sports. In Life Culture Sports, in that podcast, I talk about just things to deal with life and culture. You know, I'm talking about race. A lot of people don't like to talk about that, but it's a big discussion nowadays. I talk about politics, talk about relationships, whatever's going on. You know, I like to just give my opinion on it. So go check that out. You know, and um, and that's it. So coming up, we're going to get into NBA news. All right. Let's get into this NBA news. JR, Mr. Untied Shoes Smith, got a four year, $57 million contract from the Cleveland Cavaliers. Let me sip my tea on that one. Actually, I'm drinking Dunkin' Donuts coffee. <laughs> I just plugged him, didn't I? That was a mistake. I didn't mean to do that. But the coffee is hella good. Everybody know that. So, is JR Smith overpaid? getting about 15 million a year is J.R. Smith overpaid and I would say yes and no it depends on what you want him to do you see there's something that a lot of people don't look at but certain players are worth more to a particular team than other teams like on the Knicks J.R. Smith wasn't worth 5 million why because the things we wanted him to do like, if we paid J.R. Smith $15 million, we would have need him to be J.R. Smith that was in the second half of the season when he won sixth man of the year. We would need that all the time. 17, 18 points a game, under control, penetrating, all of that. We would need that. He's not that player all the time. You know, he's up and down. 
He has talent. We know that. That's why he's getting that money. But uh, for the Cleveland Cavaliers, he's not overpaid. For what they need him to do, he does it great. He's not afraid to take the big shot. He's, he, he'll take the big shot and make the big shot. He is now have to be considered a champion. He's won a championship with them. Now, speaking of overpaid, I do think Shumpert is overpaid because I don't think he's a great defender like everybody makes him out to be, like he's the second coming of Tony Allen, even though I thought he could be. I think Shumpert is overpaid getting $10 million. He is terrible on offense, and his defense is okay. But anyway, back to J.R. Smith. So, again, I don't think he's overpaid for the Cleveland Cavaliers. For any other team, he'd have been overpaid. And it's so funny that he got $15 million from them because I don't think he had any leverage. Well, this is what the thing is. Cleveland didn't. Cleveland had the leverage, actually, because LeBron already signed a multiple multi-year contract. Unless he got outs after each year, which I don't know. And he's not going to leave. But I feel like Cleveland boxed themselves into a corner. First of all, Cleveland, I, I believe they're over the cap. So it's not like they was going to get a player of uh, J.R. Smith's caliber on open market. I mean, you had Gerald Green. But is Gerald Green better than J.R. Smith right now? And then he would have to come in and play this role? No, he's not. So they had no choice. So to the Cleveland Cavaliers, yes, he's worth that money. They needed to keep that team together. Also in NBA news, Kevin Durant is talking and Russell Westbrook is tired of talking. Now, if you remember back in the summer, I did a podcast. It's labeled Kevin Durant is a sucker. It's right there on uh, YouTube. You can find it. I talked all about how, and I'll, I'll rehash it. I'll, I'll bring it back up. How, and, and I, I caught this early, how Kevin Durant decided to sign with Golden State Warriors. No problem. Nobody ain't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with that. You know, I like, I love super teams. That's when NBA is at its best, when you have super teams. So I love super teams. I mean, tell me a championship team that wasn't a super team, and maybe they got lucky that one year. But most super, so most uh, teams are super teams. Most championship teams are super teams. Look at Bill Russell's Celtics. They had seven Hall of Famers. <laughs> you don't think that was a super team? They won 11 straight championships. You don't think that was a super team? Anyway, I digress. I will get to that a little bit later also. So, Kevin Durant is out here saying, you know, he loves the unselfish way that Golden State plays, unlike what he was used to. I mean, if you hear Kevin Durant talk, he sounded like he was in purgatory. You know, he left Golden, he left Oklahoma City. Didn't bother giving his boy the heads up. Okay, say you didn't want to give your boy the head up, heads up and let him know you were leaving. That's fine. You didn't have to let him know you was leaving. That's cool. But after you already left, you could have hit him up with a text. Yo, man, I love playing with you. It was real. You know, you still my boy. We still people. Whatever. Or you could just be like, yo, I ain't really fucking with you. You didn't even have to send him a text for that because your actions is showing me that what you're saying to Russell, Sim Russell Simmons, what you're saying... To Russell Westbrook is that you're not fucking with him. You're not his friend. You're not cool with him. So all that shit you were doing was bullshit. Was fake. You know. So Russ hasn't spoken to him. And then the first time you mention your old team, you mention them in a negative light. I stand behind that. Kevin Durant is a sucker. He a sucker. And he looking weak to me as a man. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He's looking weak to me as an adult. This ain't about basketball right here. This is about somebody you spent seven to eight years with. Was was one game away from, went, from going to the championship. By the way, you choked that shit away. Yes. You were the team leader. 
and you kind of oh let, 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 let me change this when you're up 3-1 and you lose that series there's some choking involved you didn't completely choke but being up 3-1 just like golden state was up 3-1 to cleveland there's some choking at least golden state has some circumstances with draymond green being out <laughs> and some great performances golden state gutted those wins out to win that series against oklahoma city those turnovers at the end of the game you and russ was bugging so i'm telling everybody watch golden state i believe they're hella talented but there's some mental weakness on this team i think curry has some mental weaknesses and I think Durant has mental weaknesses. I don't think Klay Thompson does, and I don't think Draymond does. Curry has yet to show us some great play in the finals, in the last two finals. What, uh, even in the playoff runs, he's been okay. He has been less than himself than regular season. And that shows me that the pressure kind of gets to you in those situations. Now, I'm not saying that he's going to stay this way. I'm just saying look out for that. If you put pressure on this team, they have so much talent, which means so much pressure. If they struggling in any round but the finals, even in the finals, if they start struggling, you might see some nerves. And I'll say this, one way you attack Golden State is in the paint. Their worst nightmare is going to be the same thing, way almost the same way Oklahoma City almost beat them, pounding them inside either with bigs or penetration. Penetration is going to be harder because they have some really good perimeter D. But if they think they're going to win a bunch of championships with Draymond playing center, that's not going to happen. That's just my opinion. Now, don't get me wrong; they're going to win because they have so much talent. But. If they, if they face a team, I think San Antonio is a bad matchup for them. I think I thought that Oklahoma City was a bad matchup for them. Teams that heavy goal would made uh, uh, Cleveland a bad matchup, but Cleveland started going to the rack on them. Who, who was going to stop LeBron going to the paint? And this is this is so crazy though, right? Him going to Golden State. The crazy part about this is that now, you know who this really helps? It helps LeBron. If LeBron, if Cleveland beats Golden State with Durant, what does that do for LeBron's legacy? LeBron's probably saying, yeah, yeah, now I can show them. Because LeBron owns Durant on a matchup basis. Durant seems to be a little scared of LeBron. When they play, LeBron tends to dominate Durant. That brings us to the end of the NBA news. We're going to get into the next topic of the week coming up. Next topic of the week. Carmelo Anthony. Top 15 NBA player. Number 15 according to slam mellow doesn't like it mellow think he's better than that you know it's so funny that i've always wanted to ask is like or i always wanted to hear when when players say like by mellow saying he believes he's better than top 15 you know he's taking shots at people above him on that list he's saying yo i'm better than blake griffin by the way he is I'm better than Damian Lillard. 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 By the way, he is. You know, he's saying he's better than these players. But I wonder why, why you never hear players like go back at it. Say something back like, you're not better than me, dog. <laughs> but anyway, the reason why I, I use this as a topic because, first of all, I think Melo. It, all right. When you do, when people do these rankings. It's just to get people talking. The season's coming. People are getting excited for the season. So they bring out these rate rankings. Sometimes it's during a slow time. But now it's right before the season. And what I need to know is what's the criteria for the top 15 player? Because the criteria 
it, it, I don't know how to like. Is it uh, what they're going to do going forward? Is it how talented they are? Is it their accomplishments? Is it their achievements as far as winning? The reason why I ask this is because like everybody's darling is Anthony Davis. He's no don't get me wrong, I think Anthony Davis will be a great player, but he's not a great player yet. Carl Anthony Towns will be a great player. He's not a great player now. I mean yet. He's not. Kyrie Irving, he's not a great player yet. But he may be. What he did last year, yes. You see, it's funny. I'm a fan of Dr. J's, right? I was a little boy. I idolized Dr. J. Yes, I did. So I guess I'm telling my age a little bit. But I was a little boy. Little, little boy. <laughs> uh, but Dr. J made a good point. He was on Bill Simmons' podcast a way back when he was still at Grantland. And then uh, when Bill Simmons was still at Grantland. And he said... You need years in the league before I can consider you great. Unless you come in and blaze a glory in the first three years. and Like Jordan was a great player within his second, third year. He averaged 37 in his second year. It was like, that's not happening. So my thing is, like, I don't believe in putting players. Like, I, I, when, I when I think of best players in the league, the first thing that comes to my mind is who they're playing with. And are they the franchise player of their team? Why is this important? It's important because when you're the franchise guy, when you're the guy that carries the load, teams game plan for you. When you're the second guy, teams game plan, game plan for you, but it becomes more difficult. You know, they put their focus on the first guy. When you're the third guy, you can get off even more because teams have to pay attention to the first two. And why I know I'm right about this, the same thing happens in baseball, in, in, in basketball, in, 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 I mean in football, and other sports, is that when you have great players on your team, typically you don't win MVP because there are other great players on your team. This has happened in sports for the longest time. That's why when they're talking about MVP, they're saying that nobody from Golden State really has a chance to win it because they have all those great players. You feel me? You understand where I'm coming from now? So when your team is loaded, it's hard for you to be considered the best player in the league because when teams play against you, they have to focus on all the other players as well as yourself. That's why the greatest teams don't always have MVPs. Except for Chicago, of course, because clear head and shoulders above everybody was Michael Jordan. But why do you think Shaq didn't win MVP every year? Because he had Kobe. We know he was the best player in the league, but he had Kobe. 28-14, 28-13, destroying people. But he had Kobe. So he couldn't be considered the best player in the league. Iverson won his lone MVP. Why? He was the best player on his team that did very well, but it was just him. So you had the game plan for just Iverson, and he still was destroying you. Now, let me bring it back to Carmelo Anthony. All of these players that are ahead of him that are considered great all play with a great player. The best player in the league to me I mean, well, not to me, to everybody, is LeBron James, no doubt. And I'm basing this off of, first of all, six straight championships. I mean, it's easy. The stats say it. Uh, his accomplishments say it. <laughs> like, all the criteria I mentioned, and he's still better than everybody. Like, talent, like, literally across the board. Like, he's elite defensively and elite offensively. He's an elite passer. He's a winner. I mean, come on. <laughs> he's like the second best player of all time. That's how great he's showing us to be. I mean, he's really that good. However, even with saying that about LeBron, he's also played with Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh in their prime. And he's won. 
when he was, but with, but when he was with Cleveland. Now I'll tell you one thing about LeBron: you put him on a team with a bunch of bums. Probably not so much now, as he's older and he probably won't be Mister Everything. You put him on a team with a bunch of bums, or like that Cleveland team that he carried to the finals. Only LeBron can do that. So that was clear about how great he is. But to be fair, he's had great players on his teams. That Cleveland team, now that he has, Kyrie Irving, Tristan Thompson, Kevin Love is a role player. Past franchise player is a role player on his team. Jarrah Smith is like, what, the fifth best guy on his team? That's why he's worth the money because he's great for that team. They got a bunch of wings. They have a system. They, 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 they're good. The next guy on the list, Kevin Durant. I think he's the second best player in the NBA. Yes, I do. But again, he's played the majority of his career. He had he had James Harden, who we see how good he is, offensively at least. He's had Russell Westbrook, Westbrook who many believe may be MVP this year. I don't know, but many believe this. Again, who has been Melo's second best player in his entire career? He's had Iverson, the tail end of Iverson being Iverson. And they were good. They were actually good with him. Uh, and he's had Chauncey. And when he had Chauncey, where did he go? Conference Finals. The only time he ever reached the Conference Finals, actually. So, those things factor into me. Now, I'm not going to run down a list of the top players. Like, if you want to say Steph Curry is number three. Okay. I mean, Steph Curry's a great player. But he has Klay Thompson. He has Draymond Green. He has a hell of a team there. And a great coach. Not taking credit away. I'm giving credit to how great these teams are. But if you're going to give credit to how great these teams are, I don't think you need to take away from, like, it's like with Carmelo, they conveniently, they conveniently ignore his situation. So, let me just name a few players I believe Carmelo is better than. He's better than Paul George. You know, everybody says, oh, Paul George is so great. You know, this year, now, this year, Paul George may prove to be better than Carmelo this year. Like, this is the one year maybe he can he can show. But to me, the reason why I don't put Paul George ahead of Carmelo, not yet, because Carmelo been doing this as the number one player on his team. Paul George has been the number one player on his team for about two or three years. Melo has been the number one player on every team he's played on for every year of his career. And now, what, he's in year 12, 13? 11, 12, 13, I don't even remember. But he, he's he's in... Come on. Like, I'm not putting anybody ahead of Carmelo who's not a franchise player. Period. If you're a role player, if you're the second best player on your team, third best player on your team, and you're hella talented, I'm not putting you ahead of Carmelo. Because teams are keying on that other guy. So I'm not putting... And, and I think that's a flaw that a lot of people do when they judge play, teams, players. Like, to me, Kyrie is not better than Melo. Put Melo with LeBron. You don't think Melo would be complete... Melo, LeBron hitting Melo for those wide open threes? Come on, stop it. Stop it. Let me see who else they had ahead of Melo. Oh, Blake Griffin. Look, I like great Blake Griffin, but you got to stay healthy. I've heard it over and over. The saying is the best ability is availability, right? You got to stay healthy. There's no way around that. So I'm sorry. Uh, Blake Griffin is not better than Carmelo. First of all, he's just not better than Carmelo. Let's just start there. And he hasn't been healthy. And he has Chris Paul. Give Melo Chris Paul. Come on. I ain't even mentioned JJ, JJ Redick and, and, and uh, Jamal Crawford and DeAndre Jordan. 
the Doc Rivers as a coach? Come on, again. Show me a guy who doesn't have shit on his team like Carmelo has and all the different coaches that he's had to deal with. So, so far, the players that are ahead of him have more things going. Even Lillard had uh, uh, this guy. I didn't forget his name now. My apologies. Damon Lillard has CJ McCollum. Before that, he had LaMarcus Aldridge. Some people are just fortunate in that manner. And then for those who say, well, like two-way players, and that's the new thing, two-way players, two-way players. Well, let's look at the top five players of all time. Jordan, definite two-way player. One of the greatest, he's the greatest. Kareem, two-way player, yes. LeBron, two-way player. Russell, not really a two-way. Bill Russell wasn't really a two-way player. He's a defensive player. But he's still top five all time. Larry Bird? I mean, based on what y'all saying, Paul George is better than Larry Bird too. Because Larry Bird was never known as a defensive stopper. And the names I mentioned are no order. So don't argue with me. I'm just naming great players. All time great. Magic Johnson, was he known for defense? Was he known as a two-way player? As I recall, Michael Cooper was on that team and he would guard the other team's point guards at times. I actually saw this. Not reading this, I saw this. Just saying. Byron Scott also would help out on defense. So, and, and, and by the way, speaking of offense, Jordan, Kareem, LeBron, Wilt, Bird, Magic, they were all known for offense. Basically, they had good D, but they were known for offense. If you name your top 10 greatest basketball players in the history of basketball, I would think that mm, probably nine of them were known for offense. And then there's Bill Russell. Not saying they weren't good on defense, not saying they couldn't play both ways, but they were known for offense. That's where they made their bones and their money. So, where do I think Melo is ranked? Where do I think he, he deserves to be ranked? Based on my criteria, my own personal criteria, players I put ahead of Melo, I'm going to do it that way. LeBron, Kevin Durant, Steph Curry. You know... I'm gonna, of course, I'm gonna put Kawhi Leonard because Kawhi Leonard is a two. He's he's a great, 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 great defender, like legendary. I believe he's a legendary defender. But again, he has Lamarcus Aldridge. But I want to see how he is now as the team's number one because last year in the playoffs he didn't show me that he can carry a team. But remember, the guys I'm putting in Hello Metal. Look, look what look what I'm doing here. LeBron franchise guy, KD franchise guy, Curry franchise guy, Kawhi Leonard franchise guy. Okay? Let me keep going. Because I'm not counting just skill and what you might be. And that's the thing that I realize what they do with these things. They count, well, let's add in your age and what he might do. Well, when he does it, then we'll put him ahead of Melo. When Anthony Davis shows that he's great, when he does it, then we can put him ahead of Melo. Ahead of Melo. Chris Paul. Hmm. That's a good one. That's a good one. Would I put Chris Paul ahead of Carmelo Anthony? Oh, boy. I'm going to say yes, because any team you put Chris Paul in is going to be guaranteed uh, at least 10 to 15 more wins. Chris Paul is hella good. Um, let me think if I can. Uh, I don't put Kyrie ahead of him. So right now I have what? Uh, Curry, no order. LeBron, Curry, uh, KD, Chris Paul, Kawhi Leonard. 
Right now, I got Melo at number six. Now, by the way, this is just off the top of my head. In the comment section, you can name other people if you want. You want to put name them other people and throw them in there, and, and I'll discuss it on my next podcast. And, you know, just a little tidbit. You know, but right now, I, I'll put him at numbers. I don't put James Harden ahead of him. James Harden defense is a super minus. Like, he's like really a super minus right now on defense. I don't put George, Paul George, George um, ahead of him because he hasn't been doing it long enough. James Harden is approaching quickly because James Harden now, it's his team. It's just about James Harden. We'll see what he does this year. But to me, if you're the guy that team's key on, I'm sorry, that has to count for something. That has to count for something. What stat do you have that shows how much... That's why I heard a great podcast that said that the players and the coaches around the league hold Melo at a higher regard than the stats guy. You know why? Because those guys are looking at tape. They're not looking at stats. They're looking at tape. And they're playing against him, and they realize how difficult it is to defend him, and how much you have to devote your your defense to stopping Melo. It's just that Melo has never had any player an equal in talent or even close to as good as him. So we'll see. That's why I'm again. I bring it back to Melo this season. It's all about all the new additions. With all the new additions the Knicks got, it's all about Carmelo Anthony. It's about Carmelo with those additions. And is he young enough still to do what he does with those additions? Does he have enough confidence in those additions to just play his role? If he does, this team is going to be something this year. It's plain and simple. I wanted to get into something really quick. I didn't get the chance to get into it. Uh, I don't know. I was maybe saving it for another podcast. But I went over my time. Hopefully... Hopefully, guys, you know, you listen to this and like I'm 43 minutes in. Um, I want to talk about Nick's cuts. Um, I think that I think Justin Hamilton may get cut. I think Amundsen may get cut. I think uh, sometime in the middle of the season, I think that Kylo Quinn will get packaged and traded. So if they keep Justin Holiday, it might be to package him in a trade for possibly like a first round pick or something. Because I, I believe they're going to trade Kyle O'Quinn. I don't think he's going to stay on this team. Uh, I think Vuj- I think with the play of Ron Baker, Jason Randall, and, Vuj- and Vucevic, or and I'm sorry, Vujovic, Vujicic, I always get his name wrong. I, I, he needs a Sasha. All right, I'm calling him Sasha. With those three players... I think that Justin Hamilton may be the odd man out. But then again, they may keep him for trade bait for the February. Because I believe the Knicks will be active at the trade deadline, regardless of their record. Because it's all about building up assets. So if you can trade two players and bring back, because injuries happen, you can trade two players and bring back like a hot, this draft is loaded. Players may be, team may be willing to give up uh, draft picks this year. Who knows? You know. But it's been fun. It's been real. This, but this brings us to the end of the Knicks Home Court Podcast. Again, you can find me on iTunes under Life Culture Sports. No spaces. You can find Knicks Home Court on there. You can also go to YouTube under Knicks Home Court. Where you can find my pod, my podcast. You can also find me on SoundCloud under Life Culture Sports, or you can go to the website, lifeculturesports.com forward slash Nick's Home Court. Eventually, I'll be taking calls, but for now, you can email me. And you know what, please, I, I would appreciate your input. Uh, you can email me at nickshomecourt at gmail.com. With any questions, anything you want me to look into, I look forward to making you a part of the show. Until next time, I'm your host. My name is Greg Armstrong. Everybody take care. Peace.